Okay, so uh, guys, let's kick it off. I want to welcome my special guest today, Juan Montes from the Tax Problem. Um, we I decided to put this kind of uh, Zoom meeting slash webinar podcast together because there's a lot of stuff going on right now with taxes and the IRS and different things going on right now with with COVID nineteen. Juan, you were a guest on my podcast, uh, you know, a few months back, and we talked about kind of your story and your business and how you got into it. Um, so anybody who wants to find out a little bit more about Juan Montes, definitely go check out the episode that I did with Juan and you can learn a little bit more about him and his background. But I really want to make this uh, episode just more educational and kind of get into some nitty gritty. Um, us as real estate professionals, we get a lot of questions from our clients about taxes and, um, and also being an entrepreneur and self-employed. Uh, there's a lot of questions going on right now about, you know, how these different things, you know, are affecting us, the different uh, the extensions that happen, all the stuff that's been happening since COVID. So I want to cover some stuff that will apply towards, you know, entrepreneurs that, that we can take advantage of and, and educate ourselves. So maybe some general topics that we get a lot. And then also um, some stuff more geared just towards specifically property owners, because a lot of our clients will probably watch this as well. And there may be some, um, some education that we can give them as far as being a property owner and, and what they need to know. So Juan, to kick it off really quick, uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, ask was, you are an en enrolled agent, right? Correct. And I, and I think we talked about that you know, in, our, in our last podcast, but give me like the, the, the 30 second, what's the difference between an enrolled agent, the tax preparer, the CPA, if I go to H and R Block and do my taxes, like what's the difference? What do I need to know as as a consumer? Uh, good question. So in California, there are four different individuals who can prepare a tax return for a fee. One is an attorney, second is an enrolled agent, a third is a CPA, and a fourth it's what's called a registered tax preparer. And the big difference is the the testing required, and then uh, level of education can be a factor. But in reality, when it comes to taxes, you really, the goal is you want to work with someone who has the experience and, and with what your needs are. And two, ideally, you want to make sure that there's some, you know, that they carry E&O insurance, errors and emissions insurance, and they protect your data, things like that. But for example, as an enrolled agent, you have to pass three exams, three, four hour exams that are administered by the uh, U.S. Treasury, which is the overarching entity under which the IRS falls. And the we have unlimited representation rights before the irs and the state tax agencies so if somebody has an issue we get a power of attorney and we literally step into your shoes they'll communicate through us we get copies of all the mail you receive and they it's actually illegal for the irs to reach out to you once there's a power of attorney on file they'll deal directly with me i'm your representative and and i'm the person advocating for you got it got it okay so there's a few differences in what you can do versus like a CPA or uh, a tax preparer, right? You know, C CPAs have these unlimited representation rights as well. And of course, attorneys do. Uh, you know, attorneys have their area of specialty as well. But in, in law school, for example, I graduated from law school and there wasn't a single tax class because it's not a requirement. And when you take the state bar exam, there is no tax law on the state bar exam either. So unless an attorney goes out and, and gets that experience in the workforce or takes additional training or education like an LLM or something like that, they, they won't necessarily have a, a tax background. Um, the only individuals that are not allowed to represent taxpayers before the IRS at, at all levels are the registered preparers. They're considered what's called unenrolled preparers. And in California, the majority of preparers are actually CTEC preparers. Doesn't mean they're not good. Doesn't mean they're not skilled. It's just that their registration is technically not a license and it doesn't give them the right to do that type of work. They could mm. defend an audit on a return they prepared, for example, but they cannot defend an audit on a return they did not prepare. But for me, anybody who calls me, I can represent them. As got an enrolled it, got agent. It. Okay, that makes sense. Um, good stuff. Um, so that gives me some clarity on kind of what you can do now, like the H and R blocks or like the local tax preparer down the street, you know, that come out seasonal, uh, are those good? Are those good for some people? 
who should go there, who would come see you, you know, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> you know, I started out seasonal. It was a quote unquote side gig. So I definitely will never knock or disparage. You know, there's, there's a client for everyone uh, depending on where you are in your career and, and what your focus wants to be. What I'll say though, is that for example, yesterday I spoke to a gentleman, he owns a couple of rental properties. He's investing in stock. He's a day trader. He's got options from um, investing in, in early stage startups. So the guy's got a pretty complex tax situation, but he was going to H&R Block and there were all kinds of mistakes. And actually, you know, let me, I already said the name, but I won't use any names <laughs> going forward. But point is, he was going to a preparer that wasn't, didn't have the level of experience he required. Mm. Um, and he kind of just felt he wasn't getting the advice that he, he wanted. He didn't actually complain about anything. It was more like, I know I could be leveraging more and saving more. And that's what I'm looking for. So now we're working together. So really is, is know what you need and make sure whoever you're going to is going to provide that. The other thing is there are some preparers that you give them your documents, they'll prepare the return, they hand it back and they say, sign here. There's really no advice or communication or anything like that. It's not a bad business model, but it's not, that's not an advisor and they normally will have a lower fee. For me, I'll ask you a bunch of questions once you give, your, give me your document. We're going to review your return at the end. You're going to get a, um, uh, a complete review, and I'm going to give you advice based on everything I saw and the questions I asked you. And I'm also available year-round. This is all I do for a living. And all of my clients, I tell them, call me, because any questions you have, you're better off getting good info before a mistake happens, because in tax, oftentimes you cannot undo something once you've done it. And you want to make sure that I'm my clients every single day I get a call from someone and all of that is included in my fee, but my fee is also not 60 bucks. Like you'll find in some places. Um, Got it. So higher fee because I offer an awful lot more as well. So it sounds like to me, like maybe the simpler your tax situation is then you can maybe seek out a lower level service, the more involved or you have more stuff or you need more strategic planning or advice and, stuff like that, you're going to want to go with a higher level type of service. Exactly. And, and the other thing is the consistency. You want your advisor to get to know you because I mm -hmm. can't tell you how many times I've saved people in the hundreds of thousands of dollars just because I knew something that we discussed maybe a couple years before. And when they, you know, say they said something and I was like, but wait a minute, you know, what about X, Y, and Z? And they're like, you're right. And we end up avoiding this costly mistake. Um, got it. Got it. And so for, for example, yeah. to give you an idea, uh -huh. yeah, for a, for example, what that mistake was not long ago, a client wanted to add their son to the title of their property. They're, they're older. They're, it was kind of their, their estate plan. Let's call it that because, you know, they didn't want something to happen to them. And then what happens to their house and the house has like a million dollars in equity. But, but I said, wait a minute, if you do that, it's going to they're going to give up all of the tax benefits they get when you actually, you know, when you, something does happen to you down the road and they inherit because it would no longer be considered an inheritance if they receive the gift during your lifetime. And uh, the reason that's important is in their case, they purchase a home for $300,000. It's worth about 1.2 million. And if it's a gift during their lifetime, the child is going to get the cost basis that the parents had, which is what the parents paid. Whereas if the child inherits the property, when they take over, let's say the fair market value is 1.2 million, it's the equivalent as if the child had paid $1.2 million for that house. And the reason that's important is they could literally turn around and sell it the next day and pay $0 in income tax because they sold it for 1.2. It cost them 1.2 the way the law works. And they actually have a loss after paying for real estate closing costs and they actually would be able to write off a loss on their tax return. Um, or if it went up to 1.5 million, they'd be paying tax on 300,000. Whereas if they received it from their parents during their lifetime, parents paid 300,000. If they sell it for 1.5, they'd be paying tax on $1.2 million. So major, major differences, right? So instead what I said is go see an attorney, drop a trust. That's going to take care of the problem you're trying to solve. And you're not going to make that mistake. That's going to cost you your child hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes.
Wow, that is huge, man. That's a huge, huge advice that you gave them, right? Because someone may not know. They may think they're doing the right thing to protect their asset. They add their kid on. Now their kid is taking it on at that lower tax basis and taking on a huge tax liability later down the line. So, man, that's 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 good. And a lot of people, if, if they're not educated, they don't they don't know any better, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, I say I came from a low inf low information household. You know, no one in my family knew any of this until I went out and figured it out because, you know, my mom didn't graduate from high school. I, actually, I'm the first in my family to graduate from high school, let alone college or, or graduate degrees. But um, and that's why I like doing what I do. You know, I get to, to help people uh, make a difference in their financial lives. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so let's move forward a little bit. So I want to move on to kind of some questions that are geared more towards the entrepreneur, the self-employed individual. And I, I actually uh, asked a couple of my teammates and a few people and they sent me some questions. So uh, there's a lot of people collecting unemployment right now during COVID, right? So whether you were a W-2 employee and you got laid off or whether you're self-employed and you were able to qualify for some of the self-employed uh, unemployment, uh, how does that affect you tax wise? Is that money taxable? What do they need to know about, you know, collecting unemployment right now? Good question. So unemployment insurance is taxable for at the federal level with the IRS. It won't be taxable on your California tax return. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure, I mean, it's, it's tough to say, you know, make sure they withhold money because if as it is, you're not bringing in enough to cover the bills. Then, then it's a really difficult decision. But what you do need to know is it will be taxable. It will be included as income on your 2020 tax return. And in California, actually across the country, people are getting an, a $600 bump per week, which is an extra $2,400 per month on top of whatever else they qualified for. So yeah. the, the top limit being $1,050 a week, which is $4,200 a month, it's not a small amount of money that would going to end up being taxable, right? Now that extra 600 bump will run out at the end of July, but the other portion of, of the unemployment will probably stick around through the end of the year, through December 31st. So it, it could turn out to be a substantial amount of money, which will be taxable. If you can afford for them to withhold, have them withhold. If you can't, you know, it's obviously going to be a difficult situation that that there are a lot of unknowns still, but it will be taxable at, at the IRS level, not in California. Got it. So you could, you could make 30 grand this year from unemployment and you're going to have to pay taxes on that 30 grand, right? Or it's going to be, yeah. it's yeah. going to be calculated in your tax return. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, that's a good yeah, and, question. And then the other thing, yeah, yeah. And the other thing to touch on, to, because it's important to know a lot of people, I think now more people know, but initially, I know I, I was one of the people who started putting information out there. Anybody who was looking for a job qualified for unemployment, even if you didn't have a job, and even if you hadn't worked in years, if you were actively looking, you qualified. If you had to stay home from work because you were taking care of a loved one or a high-risk individual, you qualified. If you yourself got COVID, you qualified for unemployment. If you were self-employed and your income decreased below the threshold, you qualified for unemployment. I mean, there was almost an exception for everybody which means an awful lot of people qualify for unemployment. So those people who've been struggling and haven't, didn't learn aware, you know, go on the EDD website and fill out a claim and uh, see what you get because it, it, a lot of people qualify for unemployment that did not traditionally qualify. Yeah, and that's true. I've, I mean, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of just in, in real estate, right? That they've never been able to get unemployment before for self-employed and now they're getting it. And I think the issue we're seeing is some people don't want to go back to work because they're making more on unemployment than they would be making at their job, right? Because of the yeah, extra 600 yeah. bucks. Um, okay, cool. So let's move forward than that. Now let's talk about those SBA loans, right? There were the um, economic uh, disaster loan. You can get up to 10,000. I know we got you know a few thousand bucks for our company. We applied for it. And then we also got uh, some payroll protection to help with the payroll expenses for a few months, we were able to qualify. So what happens with that? Am I gonna to have to report that as income? Is it the same as like the unemployment? Tell me, shed some light on that. Good question. So no, they, first and foremost, it is not income and it will not be reported as income on your tax return. 
uh, the, the first loan you mentioned, the EIDL, Economic Impact Disaster Loan, is, is the first 10,000 are free money, 1,000 per employee. So what, let me give you an example. Let's say you, and I'm not sure how many you have, how many employees you have, but let's say you had seven employees. You would get $7,000 that off the bat you will not have to repay. Mm. That'd be free money to run your business, continue paying your employees, run operations essentially. And the rest, and let's say you ended up qualifying and borrowing an additional $50,000. What ends up happening is you won't make any payments for 12 months. And then after 12 months, you start making payments and it's a 30 year loan. So you'll be making payments for the next 30 years. And the interest rate is 3.75, if I'm not mistaken. And the, but that initial sum that amounts to 1000 per employee is a grant that is not taxable and you do not need to repay. And the purpose of those loans were to help businesses, you know, keep the doors open. And then the second loan, the PPP loan, it's the payroll protection program. The goal is they wanted people to keep employees on payroll, business to keep employees on payroll. Uh, it's been insane from the moment these loans were announced. The bill was signed on the 27th of March, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And from then until through last Friday, there have been 26 updates on the rules to the PPP loan. So you have to read, you read a ton of pages just to figure out what it is and then do it another 25 times because they've, oh. it, there's been 26 iterations of this. So they keep changing things. The latest rules are this. You can, whatever you received in PPP, 60% of it needs to be used towards payroll. In, and PPP is different from the EIDL in that the PPP loan can be free money that you do not need to repay. It, it ends up being money that you use to keep your business open during this time. And as long as you use it according to the rules, you will not be repaying that money back to Uncle Sam. And so the rules are 60% of the funds of the PPP loan have to be used towards payroll. The definition of payroll is not just what you pay the employee. The definition of payroll actually includes um, some state and local taxes that you pay on behalf of the employee. It includes sick time you give the employee. It includes uh, a few other perks that you give the employee. And all of that is rolled into the, the payroll calculation. The other 40% is supposed to be used for uh, utilities and rent primarily. And if you're using the loan in that fashion, all of it can be forgivable. There are also some rules that you have to maintain the same level of headcount. So if you had 20, if your PPP amount was based on 10 employees, and once it comes time for forgiveness, you have 10 employees, then you meet that criteria. But let's say you, you had 10 and now you have nine, you, you have 90% of the employees you had, so only 90% of the loan can be forgiven. Right. Oh, so there's wow. going to be all these other little, there's going to be all these other little rules that are going to apply, but then there's exceptions to that too. If to that one employee, you offered them their job back and they declined because they wanted to stay home because they're getting more unemployment. <laughs> as long as you document that, yeah. you won't get dinged for that person not coming back. The other thing that, that's a common question is, does it have to be the same 10 employees? No. You know, people move away, people, things happen, right? People move on. And as long as the headcount is the same, that's what matters. It doesn't have to be the same 10 employees as long as the, the number of full-time equivalents is, is the same. And then the other critical piece is originally you only had eight weeks to spend this money from the day you received it. Now you have 24 weeks. So you have three times long. You have six months basically instead of only two months to spend the money, which is going to make it a lot easier to, to use up the funds in, in the ways that you're supposed to use them. Got it. Wow. So it's actually a pretty good thing. I mean, it, it's helped us out a little bit. It wasn't a ton of money for us, but it's definitely helped us weather the storm. And um, it seems like based off what you're telling me, we should fall under all those requirements and hopefully not have to pay any of it back. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And even the portion that does end up getting paid back, the terms are unheard of. It's a 1% interest rate and you have to repay it over a five year period. So it's, 
That's crazy. That, and that five-year period starts after six, six months, I believe. So, um, yeah, you have uh, five years to repay it at 1%, which is not even, you know, the cost of inflation. So, so it's essentially uh, interest-free money. Wow. Wow. Awesome. Now, I, I, we can go on and on about that. There's a lot of details there, but I want to keep this kind of, you know, high level. And if someone has, you know, a question, they can always reach out to you directly and get some more information. Um, okay. So real quick, what are the updates on tax filing, right? Taxes are normally due, what, March, April, depending if you're corporate or personal. When are taxes due now? Did they extend them again? What do I need to know? Can I file an extension? When do I got to do my taxes? By? <laughs> yeah. So tax returns are due by July 15th for federal and state of California. And the key to know is you can file an extension and the extension would move it out to October 15th. They didn't move that deadline. But the key to know is if you file an extension, it's an extension to file, not an extension to pay. So if somebody knows they're going to owe, they even if they file an extension, if they want to avoid failure to pay penalties, which can be pretty, pretty huge, they want to make sure that they pay by July 15th, they make that estimated payment for 2019. Uh, because the personal tax returns are due on the 15th of July, you can file an extension. The extension is only an extension to file, not an extension to pay. Got it. Okay. And does that apply for personal and business? It does. So that that corp, that uh, deadline applies to everyone who had a 415 deadline. I, you know, partnerships and S corporations have a deadline of March 15th, which was before these extensions were granted. I, I don't know off the top of my head if those two also were extended uh, automatically to, to July 15th, but at the end of the day, those individuals should have filed an extension before the 15th of March anyway, because or else it would have been late to begin with, right? But when the IRS made the announcement that the new deadline would be July 15th, that announcement was already after the 15th of March, which would have made those returns late already. But a regular corporation and a regular individual or sole proprietor, those are our 715 filings with an extension available to uh, October 15th. Now, do you think they'll extend it again because of, you know, we're still not out of the, the woods, so to say? You know, there's, there are rumblings that they want to push it out to September 15th. So I guess there's a possibility, but, but the info what we have today is the due date is the 15th of, of July. But if yeah. there's an update, you know, I'll, I'll shoot you uh, the details so that you could give it out to the masses and, and your, your fans. Because I, I have a feeling with a lot of businesses that are trying to weather the storm, they probably got money put away for taxes, but they're probably not getting any income in. So they may be dipping into the money that they were going to pay the IRS for their 2019 taxes. Right. Do you, yeah. do you think that's and, true? And I, I think, yeah, that's absolutely happening across the country. And then the other reality, too is business owners are, are struggling and thinking about ways to keep their business afloat, not necessarily thinking of, I need to get my tax return prepared, right? Which was the whole reason they, they extended the deadline to begin with is they knew people had other priorities at that time. You can't leave your house, you know, you shouldn't be around other people. And, and so the, the, the reasons that existed for extending it to begin with are still there. And, and now even, you know, more prevalent because now you could actually put numbers before, whereas before you expected it to be bad. Now, you know, it was bad. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice if the IRS just said, Hey, look, this year, because of all this, we're going to slash your taxes 50%, whatever you owe us, just give us half and we're cool. We're, we're good to go. I mean, they should do something like that because a lot of the people who pay the most taxes are the business owners, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah, that, that'd be real nice. <laughs> All right, so see if you can talk to someone, bro, over there at the, <laughs> at the IRS. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send my Theo a message, see if, uh, if he'll listen. <laughs> you can pull some strings or do something, right? All right. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything else that you think we should cover? Anything that you think is important right now as far as entrepreneurs are concerned, self-employed individuals, anything they need to know with updates with COVID before we move forward? Yeah, let me let me look at these questions that that your team had sent us. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention talking about those PPP loans is we've got a situation for rental property owners. So people who own rental properties qualify for the EIDL loans, 
and they also qualify for the PPP loans. So proprietors, you know, we know that they qualified, people who own partnerships, things like that. They all qualify. It's just the calculations will be different based on your circumstances. And, and we, again, we don't need to get into those details because they're fairly complex, but, but if somebody has a rental property and, you know, they have this rental income, they, need, they are able to qualify for both the PPP loan to, to protect those profit or EIDL loan, especially if their tenants aren't paying rent, to make sure they're able to pay their mortgage during this time. The other thing, which, which is not entirely tax related, but has been huge during this time is the whole um, mortgage uh, forbearance with the government, you know, part of the CARES Act from March 27th was they told the federally backed mortgages or lenders who have federally backed mortgages that people would qualify for an automatic six month uh, forbearance. And if at the end of the six month period, they still couldn't afford to pay their mortgage, they could qualify for another 180 days, which puts it at 360 days, which is basically an entire year of not paying your mortgage. But a few big concerns came up is lenders were telling people, you know, when the th they were giving people three months instead of six, or they were telling people when your three months are up or your six months are up, you're going to have to make a big lump sum payment, lump sum payment of the entire amount. So if they can't pay as they go, they're certainly not going to be able to pay it all at once when that period ended, right? And the CARES Act didn't make that clear. They didn't talk about what would happen with the missed payments. They later came out and issued guidance to the lenders basically saying you need to work with the taxpayers and ideally what you need to do is just add, tack it onto the end of the mortgage. So that's one thing. The other thing that's huge is generally when someone's not current on their mortgage, they wouldn't qualify for a refinance, they wouldn't qualify for a new mortgage. There'd be all these other problems that come along with getting into forbearance. Some guidelines were released recently where they're saying that if once once people get back on their feet and they can afford to make their payment, as long as they make three payments, they'll be able to then refinance or get a new mortgage on a new home. And the fact that they didn't make payments for six months or 12 months or whatever that period was, will not be held against them. And that will not be hitting their tax, uh, their credit report either as a, a late payment. Wow, that is huge. Because when it first came out, I actually looked into a forbearance on my property and they told me I was going to have to owe everything after three months. So I'm like, I might as well just pay it. I'm, you know, if I, if I'm struggling, I might as well cut some other stuff out or see what I could do to minimize my expenses. But if I couldn't, you know, if I was having an issue now, how am I going to pay the whole three months, you know, in, in one pop, right? So that is huge, you know? So I actually, just, I just left it alone. I didn't, I didn't take the forbearance, but I might have to revisit that and see if it makes sense because we're still, there's a big transition of us trying to get back into the office and, and, and get back on our feet. And I'm sure a lot of people are going through the same struggles right now. Um, yeah, and the thing is, they, what they needed to avoid was a wave of foreclosures, right? Because if they expect you to make these four payments or seven or 12 or whatever the number is at, all at once, people aren't going to be able to do that. And that initiates the foreclosure process. And then we have a repeat of 2008, where there's 10 foreclosed properties on every street, and you know prices tank and everything else. So, so 2008 is what drew this lesson to to tell them. And then the other thing is just yesterday, Powell, the head of the Fed, Federal Reserve, came out and and their forecast is we're not going to really be out of the woods on this until like 2022, at least economically. They expect all of this year high unemployment. All of next year, it'll be a little better, but still high unemployment. And we won't really start seeing smaller numbers of unemployment until like 2022. Wow. And all of that yeah. factors into to the situation about making mortgage payments and everything else. Wow. Wow. Good information, man. Um, okay. So I want to wrap up the end of this segment with just talking about some general questions that we usually get from property owners. Uh, when we're helping people buy homes, sell homes, especially, there's always questions surrounded about what are my tax liabilities when I sell my home? Um, a lot of people that are selling their homes and moving out of the area and stuff, they bought their homes a long time ago. Um, so I just want to talk quickly, maybe just give us a quick overview of how do we calculate taxes, maybe some of the basics when I'm selling my primary residence. If, 
if I bought my home for $100,000 and now it's worth a million and I want to sell it today, what am I looking at and how do I figure out kind of rough numbers? Okay. So great one because just this week I have a client with this exact issue. She went to a prepare, wasn't like we were talking in the beginning of the segment, that prepare wasn't quite up to speed on, on the rules and told her she had a $58,000 tax bill. Uh, so, so what happened is she bought this home in 2005 for $500,000. She sold it last year for $810,000. So there's a $310,000 gain, you know, apparently a $310,000 gain. But what happens is when someone lives in a property and it's their primary residence and they live there for two out of the five years, uh, from the date of sale looking backwards they qualify for an exemption where they will not pay taxes on up to a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar gain or profit so in her case you know just using rough numbers 810 minus 500 at three hundred and ten thousand dollar profit right it was her primary residence she lived there since 2005 so off the bat two hundred and fifty thousand will not be taxable so now, now that leaves us with sixty thousand dollars to deal with well the other thing you can reduce are the cost of sale. So real estate commissions paid, cost of escrow, you know, all of these miscellaneous costs that you incur when you're selling it end up being an expense that will offset that gain. So you're able to, you won't pay tax on that either. Then the other component to this that is pretty huge and, and people, anyone who owns a property, you know, if you're replacing the driveway, you're replacing the roof, you're remodeling the kitchen, or actually you, I think you did a massive remodel on your house recently. Save those receipts and take pictures of everything because even if you don't have some receipts, as long as you can prove you did the work, you'll get some kind of tax benefit. It's just not going to be maybe what, what you spent, right? And there's case law that backs this up. But at the end of the day, whatever you've spent in improvements on this property adds to the basis also. So in her case, we didn't need to dig into improvements too much because between closing costs and um, the $250,000 exclusion, her tax return is actually getting her about a $5,000 refund wow. between federal and state where the preparer where she'd gone told her she was going to pay $58,000. So if she didn't double check that, if she didn't reach out to someone, she would have been forking over a check for 58,000 bucks on money she didn't even owe. So, so that's you know, loosely how it gets calculated. What you paid for the property, what you've spent on improvements on the property, you subtract that from the sales price, and then you also can subtract your closing costs, and then you end up with what the taxable gain is. Notice nowhere in there I said how much you owe on the property, because what you owe on the mortgage has no bearing whatsoever on the way capital gains are calculated. And see that, that that's, first of all, man, that, that's awesome that, that you were able to educate her, because imagine you go to your tax preparer and they're like, you owe $60,000, and even one of our clients, I think, had that issue. We referred her over to you and you were able to, to talk to her about it. But if you tell me I owe 60 grand, I'm like, what the, where do I get this money from? And then they talk to you and they're like, you owe zero or you're getting 5,000 back. That's, that's a huge discrepancy, man. You know, so I'm sure you, you made her day. You made her year. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah and, in the, and you're being told in the middle of COVID, you owe $58,000, right? <laughs> wow. Wow. Crazy when that's you're not crazy. working. Uh, crazy. And then the other thing too, is that what you said at the end, notice how you didn't say what they owe on the property. That's actually a big misconception that we get from a lot of clients. Like, Hey, I'm selling my house for a million. I owe 800,000, you know, uh, that's 200. I get to keep all this. They think it's what you owe, but it's like, they're not talking about the, the refi they did and they pulled out 300 grand equity line or whatever. Right. So never in there. It's what you owe. Is that, that's correct. Right. Yep. So, yeah, what you owe is 100% irrelevant to the calculation. So what you bought it for, minus what you're selling it for, minus all your deductions. And then you said it was 250, they get to reduce. And if you're married, is it, is it more, right? It's 500,000, so 250 for individual. And you know, sometimes brothers and sisters or friends own a property together. Let's say four of us owned a property together. Well, each of us would have a 250,000 exclusion. So that property could have a million dollar in, in gains and not, and no one would pay taxes on that gain. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. 250,000 per person. If it's a primary residence and you live there two out of the last five years, looking backward from the date of sale. Wow. Okay. 
And that only applies to your primary residence, not rental properties or second homes or anything like that. Got it. Got it. Now, let's say after all those deductions, you know, because I bought my house a long time ago for, you know, really cheap and I sold it for a lot. I still have some taxable gain left over. Let's say at the end of everything, there's still $100,000 that I owe taxes on. Now, how do they figure out how much I'm going to pay on that 100000 that's left over? Good question. So that's, uh, that count calculation is pretty complex. So I can't give you an exact number, but basically long-term capital gain rates are anywhere from 10 to 20%. So actually zero to 20%, because somebody like a married couple that has two children, they could pay zero capital gains on up to right around $75,000, 70 to $75,000. So if the profit was under 70,000 bucks, possibly there's no tax at all. But if the gain is 200,000 on top of that, so what determines whether you pay 10, 15 or 20% in that range is your overall income, how much you have. And the higher you have, the higher you end up paying on the capital gain. And then California, this one is, is pretty bad for California. California doesn't have a long-term capital gains rate. So on the California side, it, the gain of sale of a property that ends up being taxable is treated no different than your wages at your job or from your business. So it could be taxed up to 13.3%. Wow. The, the other thing that can happen on the federal side is there's something called the net investment income tax, which is just over 2%. And the thresholds are pretty high, but if you're up in the three to $400,000 in income range, um, all in, you end up paying an additional 2% tax, just over 2% tax because of the net investment income tax as well. So that's another wow. kicker to, to be aware of. So I know there's variables, but what I'm hearing is you're going to have to pay some state tax on that money, right? You say California was 13%, and then you're going to have to pay anywhere from 0 to 20% from federal. And then if you have a higher threshold, if you, let's say you make a lot of money, from your actual income, you can have another 2% on top of that, right? So there's a, big, there's a big swing right there, right? So I think it really boils down to how much money do you make outside of this property, right? What your income is, and then what that actual number is that you're left over for taxes, right? You put those all together, and then you can figure out the, your tax rate, yeah. right? Exactly. It's a puzzle. All those different pieces, we have to put them together to, to arrive at those numbers. Got it. And I think the big thing is when I meet with clients that want to sell their home, the first, and especially if I know they've lived there for a long time, the first thing I say is, hey, are you aware of your tax liability on this home? And I cannot tell you how many times where our clients go, huh? What do you mean? Uh, I thought like, as long as I'm going to buy another home and put it in there within two years, I can, uh, you know, I don't have to pay any taxes. So I think that was how it used to be, right? You can transfer the, your, your, your gain or something? What, was that true at all? You know, that might have been before my time, but in my 15 years, that's never been the rule. The only area where you're able to sell one property and, and buy another and not pay taxes are investment properties for the 1031 exchanges. So the way those, those exchanges work is the property you're selling has to be a, an investment property. And what happens is when you put it on the market, you have to um, make sure you hire what's called a qualified intermediary. And what happens is when the property actually sells, escrow will not cut you a check. They'll send the money to the qualified intermediary. And they'll charge you a fee. I think it's right around $700 or so. But they have to hold the money. If at any point in time you touch that money, you're, you cannot do a tax-deferred exchange. So you have to hire a qualified intermediary. From the day you sell the property, you have 45 days to identify the replacement property. You can identify usually three properties, and then you have 180 days from the date of sale where you have to close on one of those three properties you identified within those first 45 days. So the 180 doesn't start after the 45, it starts from the date of sale. The 45 days also start from the date of sale. And then, so the, and then the other key thing, there's a property you end up buying also has to be an investment property. It cannot be a home that you buy and then just move into it. If you do that, it doesn't qualify for the tax deferred exchange. Uh, a common question is, well, what if I don't move into it right away? 
there's a safe harbor rule that says that if in the first 12 months after you acquire that investment property, it's rented for more than 14 days um, and you don't live in it, then you you could convert it to personal use after that. So I guess think of a, a roughly a year timeline. If after that year you end up moving into that property for some reason, then you still end up, you know, and with this tax deferred exchange, which like you said, you know, here in the Valley, there are a lot of people who purchased their home many years ago under a hundred thousand and they might be worth one, two, three million dollars. I had a client recently purchase a home for under a hundred thousand in, in um, Menlo Park and it was worth over three million bucks. And uh, for them, they inherited the property. So they had, they got that step up in basis we talked about earlier. So the, in, in the hands of the child, it's as if the child paid three million bucks for that house. So when and they're when they sell it, they're not going to pay any taxes on that money, on three million dollars wow. in in income, even though their parents only paid a hundred thousand bucks for that house. Wow. So I think the big thing, guys, is I know this stuff can get a little complicated, and to kind of keep it simple, is when you're going to sell your primary residence, you definitely want to consult with the, your your tax advisor and see how much you're going to owe on taxes, because if you're if you think you're just getting all that profit and you're going to use that to buy your next home, you got to factor in what you're going to owe the IRS. And then with rental properties, we help a lot of clients do 1031 exchanges. We work with a good intermediary that you're talking about is there's strategic planning that you can do to sell one rental property, buy another rental property and not have to pay any taxes. And then later down the line, if you want to move into that property after you've rented it out for a year or so, you can eventually convert it to, maybe a primary residence, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, as, uh, a lot of things. The intent to have it, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so that was actually some of the next questions I was gonna ask, so we kind of naturally covered those. Um, now the last one is, to kind of wrap it up, how much mortgage interest can we write off now? I know there was some changes with the tax law um, before you can write off all your mortgage interest and now, now they've changed it at least in, I think in California. So what can you tell us about that? Good question. So the old rules were $1 million and $100,000 on an equity line. The new rule per person, I'm sorry, per, per taxpayer and under the law, an individual who's single is a taxpayer. But if somebody is married, then the family unit is a taxpayer. So husband and wife, although they are two people, they only, would only be able to write off interest on $1.1 million between mortgage and equity line. Old, those are the old rules. The new rules are you're limited to writing off the mortgage interest on $750,000. So if someone is dating boyfriend, girlfriend, and they buy a, a $1.5 million house, and let's say the mortgage is 1.5 million, they can write off the interest on the entire 1.5 million. But the moment they get married, they will not be able to write off half of the interest it will drop to 750,000. So it's uh, 750,000 per, per um, family unit or per taxpayer. So, they could, so that means whatever the interest is on that 750,000 is what they can write off, right? So if it's, if it's 20 grand of interest at the end of the year, they get to write that portion of it off. Yep, that's correct. Got it, got it. Okay, Juan, um, any last final thoughts? Anything else you want to tell anybody else out there? Anybody who's maybe a business owner, entre entrepreneur, property owner, any last key piece of advice uh, when looking at tax situations right now or just their taxes in general? Yeah, I would say, you know, always reach out to your tax advisor, whoever that may be when you have a question because these high dollar things, little mistakes can cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Always call and reach out. The advisor you're working with doesn't have the capacity to handle what you need. Look for a new advisor, even if it's only for that one year or whatever it is. But when you have a need for, for a specific expertise, make sure you look for it. If you're TurboTaxing it, same thing. Make sure you look for it because there are a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of nuances to this, that if you try to Google your way through it, it's highly unlikely you're going to get the full picture. Uh, so... So you really will save a lot of money by reaching out. And a lot of people probably could give you a free 30 minute console. Like for me, I know like with you, anybody you refer to me gets a free 30 minute console. And 
a lot of times people's questions are answered in those 30 minutes. And sometimes from there, they actually need me to do some work. And then we just discuss fees. But that initial 30 minute console is at no charge to just, uh, you know, help people out because if, if, if we can figure it out in 30 minutes, you know, I'm, I'm okay with giving that away. Awesome, man. I really appreciate that. We've referred a couple clients over to you. Uh, guys, anybody who needs help, reach out to Juan. I'll put his contact info, um, you know, in the description and stuff. Um, real quick, Juan, what's your, your website and, and what's your phone number? Website is www.thetaxproblem.com and my phone number is 408-888-5139. There you go, guys. I'll also drop that in the description, but Juan has a wealth of knowledge, guys. Like, pick his brain use up the free 30 minute consultation. I'm sure he'll, he'll definitely uh, leave you better off and answer some of your questions. And then your big specialty is you fight tax debt, right? Yep. Yep. I help people fight the IRS every day, defend audit. Just this week, we reached a settlement, a client owed 60,000 bucks. They're paying 500. So, uh, and they will be tax debt free, tax debt free. So um, yeah, we fight the IRS all day long, defend audits, appeals, uh, any tax problem, we, we figure it out. So there you go, guys. The doesn't, guarantee, doesn't guarantee the perfect. Doesn't guarantee the perfect result, but obviously, if we have something to work with, you, you know, we'll do something with it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and everyone's yeah. situation is unique. But if you have mm -hmm. back taxes that you owe, you're in a tax situation, you owe the IRS. Juan is definitely reputable. Uh, I always do my homework before I bring anybody on here and, and recommend them to my clients, and and he's definitely someone that we can trust. So. Juan, I appreciate your time, bro. I appreciate you coming on here. Hope you're staying safe and healthy during COVID. And um, I'm sure we'll be seeing each other soon with, with some clients that we can help. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. Stay safe. All right. We'll talk soon.